Uh, so John O'Flynn is Associate Professor of Music at Dublin City University, and President of the Society for Musicology in Ireland uh, from 2021 to 2024. And he's lots of publications, including Music, The Moving Image in Ireland from this year. So congratulations. Uh, the Irishness of Irish Music and five co-edited volumes. Uh, other contributions also include uh, Film Music Sound Design, and that includes an article in American Music in, in 2018 and forthcoming pieces for Palgrave Handbook of Music and Comedy Cinema for, 19, or for 2022, and Alphaville, a journal of film and screen media. And John is also preparing a new book, Empires of Sound, Music and Colonial Encounters in 20th Century Narrative Film for Palgrave Macmillan. So welcome, John. Thanks, Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome. And first of all, just to thank, um, hope I get all the names right, Ross and Dennis and Sarah and Sunita and everybody who's been behind the organisation today. Great to be here. So, um, embracing uh, so embracing aspects of Hollywood, British and Irish film production, in this paper I consider music for early narrative sound features based on the War of Independence. Uh, I first examined music for John Ford's The Informer, the screenplay changed the setting of Liam O'Flaherty's novel from Civil War to War of Independence, followed by music for The Plough and the Stars, for which Ford and screenwriter Dudley Nichols, Nichols adapted a Hollywood humanist approach to O'Casey's place at, during the 1916 Rising. By the mid-1930s, synchronized sound film production was firmly established in Hollywood, by which time a so-called classical approach to original film scoring was developed. Composers began to score musical accompaniment, which depended on original thematic material used selectively, and sometimes combined with arrangements of known tunes, and that's particularly relevant today. This approach to film scoring was one of the major characteristics of what came to be interpreted as Hollywood's golden era. The most prominent Hollywood composer from this time associated with Irish theme film was Austrian-born Max Steiner. This initially arose from his work with Irish-American John Ford for what was the second film adaptation of O'Flaherty's The Informer in 1935. What I concentrate on today is how Steiner responded to the perceived Irishness of Ford's adaptation, also involving screenwriter Dudley Nichols. This is in part informed by an examination of the Max Steiner collection held at the Brigham Young University uh, Library in Utah. And you can see uh, here a facsimile of the opening pages of Steiner's Informer score. While I found no evidence to suggest that Steiner went to any lengths to research Irish musical sources in scoring the Informer, he most likely drew on his prior experience of Irish-American stage music from vaudeville and Broadway, his connections and friendships with the Dublin-born composer Victor Herbert, and much later his conversations with John Ford. In fact, the Irish materials that Steiner used for the Informer were already well-established sonic markers of Irishness among American audiences of the time. <coughs> Early in the narrative, we hear the Rose of Tralee sung by a young street singer, Michael O'Duffy. Pitched in a high key, he effortlessly reaches the song's top note, a pitch that he later trumps when singing The Minstrel Boy. The latter occurs when the informant of the film's title, Jip O'Nolan, remorsefully makes his way to the wake for Frankie MacPhillips, the very man whose death he has caused through betrayal. While Jippo's larger-than-life Irish persona is dramatically, visually and musically represented in terms of emotional volatility and with exaggerated proportions, resonating both with O'Flaherty's text and with monster tropes of German expressionist cinema, the IRA leaders of Ford's adaptation are by contrast presented as sober, rational, masculine and heroic. The wearing of the green is sung diegetically by Frankie and Jippo in an early scene, but it is Steiner's motivic treatment of the tune that contributes to the characterization and valorization of the Irish rebel army. As well as its stirring lyrics, the ballad's march meter, simple rhythms and melody, and comfortable singing range combine to afford meanings of solidarity, sincerity, and action. This is in marked contrast to the more ornamental and technically demanding songs in tenor range that are sung by the street singer, who is ostensibly passive in the context of conflict, through his, though his vocal material intimates otherwise. In the clip that follows, we see the IRA kangaroo court investigating the betrayal of Frankie. Here Steiner transforms the wearing of the green into a slow and stately figure. So uh, 
you don't have to read music to see that. At the top there is the sort of the original tune of the wearing of the green, and then this is the elaborate orchestration for the kangaroo chord scene. Um, so he, he, he transforms it, and it sounded at the point when the camera pans across the young military volunteers who stand with fixed expressions that communicate discipline, sincerity, and dedication to the organization, which is, of course is never mentioned in the screenplay. This construction of patriotic masculinity is contrasted sharply with Steiner's scoring for the arrival of a drunken Jippo, whose pathetic fall down the entrance steps to the court is Mickey Mouse by a descending chromatic pattern and loud percussion. And that's probably the last of the... What is this? And now a little theme to uh, depict the judges and the kind of report. So released one year after The Informer, Ford's The Plough and the Stars adopted some similar musical references and techniques, now with Roy Webb as score composer. The film's opening scenes include patriotic songs and some instrumental performance, and feature a street singer, the same Michael O'Duffy, performing The Bard of Armagh, against a background of a poster enticing volunteers to enlist for the Irish Citizen Army. We next see Jack, and, and that's uh, kind of echoing the, the opening scene in The Informer. We next see, have a scene with Jack and Nora Clitheroe enjoying an evening in their tenement flat just after their honeymoon. A rendition of Kathleen McGurney is heard off screen until a reverse shot of a figure on the street reveals its source to be the same high tenor who was heard singing The Bard of Armagh earlier. Without referring to the singer or the song, Nora implores Jack, play for me at which point Jack takes out an accordion and accompanies the singer, although they don't see each other. This for me suggests a symbolic role for the tenor, not only for his contradictory so-called passive agency in articulating a Republican position, but also in the way he is seen to intercede between male and female perspectives in the adapted screenplay. Source music, as opposed to composed score, is heard just once more in Ford's The Plough and the Stars, as an Irish warp ice marching band play The Rising of the Moon. This occurs at a rally organised by the leaders of the Irish Citizens Army just before the 1916 Rising. Tom Cooper's The Dawn, released in 1936, was one of the earliest, if not the first, Irish produced sound films and the first to feature recorded instrumental music. This mainly amateur production offered a new twist on the trope of betrayal by exploring the reputation and eventual redemption of members of the O'Donovan family, who during the Fenian uprising of 1866 had wrongfully been branded as informers. This anterior perspective is effectively communicated by its opening as a pseudo-silent film with intertitles, during which incidental music is provided by a retro-sounding piano quartet. The Pat Crowley Ballroom Orchestra is credited as providing the Dawn's incidental music, although no individual composer or arranger is mentioned. This engagement of local orchestral performers is highly significant for its time. Although the soundtrack suffers from a lack of music editing and a lack of incidental music in places where you might expect it, especially during extended combat scenes between the IRA and Black and Tans. Conversely, it contains ill-matched incidental cues, such as a folksy pizzicato figure on the string quartet accompanying sniper fire across the field, like delicate music as people are shooting each other to death. Uh, so music scored for reflective moments are more convincing, as is an arrangement of the rebel song O'Donnell Laboo, heard towards the film's end, 
And we can just get a brief snatch of this in a clip of the 1989 documentary, Troubled Calm, directed by David Fox and featuring the recollections and Republican perspectives of Tyke O'Sullivan, who had appeared in the film alongside his brother Brian, who played a leading role. We're just going to get one little sound of this main quartet. Is Larry, my brother. So I was just doing that and just to illustrate Andrew the sound. Mason and uh, the bugler so we'll with Jeremiah O'Connor. Uh, I released, have a picture here oh. of the title of the film, The Dawn. Released in the same year as The Dawn, Ourselves Alone, uh, directed by Brian Desmond Hurst, was a British melodrama that sought to offer a more sympathetic perspective on all parties involved in the Irish War of Independence, distinguishing between what it portrayed as honourable and less desirable characters on both sides of the conflict. In this, it set a precedent for benign yet patronising views of Irish independence history as uh, film scholars Ruth Barton and others have argued. Opening titles music for Ourselves Alone comprises familiar tunes, The Minstered Boy, The Wearing of the Green and The Rose of Tralee, as you might recall, all previously used by Max Steiner for The Informer. For Ourselves Alone, they are arranged for strings, woodwind and, woodwind and pedal harp by English composer Harry Akers. The third of these tunes, The Rose of Tralee, segues to establishing scenic shots of the lakes of Killarney and returns as sorry, as orchestral underscore for a later romantic scene. Although incidental music cues are thin on the ground, the overall soundtrack of Ourselves Alone, I believe, is well conceived, with more attention paid to the casting of British and Irish accents than other productions of the time, and with an impressive range of what we might call, uh, although the term wasn't current then, Foley effects throughout. Furthermore, the film stands out for its diegetic music or source music scenes. An early scene depicts IRA volunteers mingling with sympathetic villagers in a local pub where a pianist and fiddler are first observed playing a set of jigs that begins with Gary Owen, another tune repeatedly used by Max Steiner for his Irish film, uh, Irish theme scores. A dialogue uh, revealing an informer subplot then rises above this music before local punter Danny, uh, played by Cavan O'Connor, is asked to perform a song by a woman in the pub perhaps as a countermeasure to the unpleasant nature of the preceding conversation. Danny obliges by singing the Rose of Tralee in a high tenor range, accompanied by the musicians present. As he sings, and it's similar to the Ford scene, the Kangaroo Court, the, the camera completes a 360 degree pan of those entranced by his performance before returning to the vocal source.
beautiful, beautiful change in my view. Um, so, as the Black and Tans, sorry, a sudden warning alerts the IRA volunteers to escape as a troop of Black and Tans approach the pub. Danny then sings the wearing of the green as he collects guns that are quickly hidden under women's clothing. As with the informer and the plow and the stars, the song represents a communitarian and unequivocally Republican ideology. Oh, and if dear and dear Shaggy, the news is going round. The Shamrock is by law for me to grow on Irish ground. No more St. Patrick's Day will keep his colour calm, his seen. For there's a crew in law again, so here in love again. I met with Napa Tandy, and he took me by the hand. And he said, how's poor old Ireland, and how old does she stand? the most distressful country that ever yet was seen. For the hanging men and women there for wearing on the green. As the Black and Tans enter, his code switching to a delicate performance of Eileen Mavorni belies his previous subversive act. In this, the film reinforces an outsider stereotype of the Irish as artistically sensitive while prone to political violence. After we view it, I'll interpret two other significant aspects of this performance in my conclusion. See you, Danny. to hear it all but I know we're stuck for time. Um, so the, this song that Sa Danny sings for the second half of the clip, Eileen Mavourneen, comes from the 19th century ballad opera The Lily of Killarney, 1862, with music composed by the German composer Julius Benedict and a libretto based on Dion uh, Boussicot's play The Colleen Vaughan. The opera became part of the so-called Irish Ring repertory, along with Balfe's The Bohemian Girl and Wallace's Maritana. In the context of Ourselves Alone, the song suggests a ballad film function, as was common in many British-produced Irish theme productions of the 1930s, including many quota quickies, and, in those, and, as, and as in those films, the inclusion of Irish or pseudo-Irish songs in Ourselves Alone is comparable to the strategic placement of scenic shots. Um, both strategies are also adopted for the dawn. This arguably broadens the appeal of the politically themed ourselves alone, though clearly not uh, enough for the Northern, Northern Ireland government of the time, which banned it on release. So my final comments are about gender. And when I wrote the abstract for this paper, I hadn't really factored in gender, but to conclude, I want to comment on the role of what might be termed the static Irish tenor in three out of the four War of Independence themed films discussed today. I suggest that the featuring of a high tenor voice in these political films, as well as in other Irish-themed ballad films, including those with John McCormack, projects a liminal figure reflective of post-independence ideology, wherein the celibacy of Catholic priesthood is venerated, yet at a remove from the populace. So though rel relatively static within the screenplay's concerned, the tenors articulate an otherness that highlights the perceived masculinity of militant Irish males, while also serving as a means of communication between male and female perspectives, and an ostensibly neutral, though ultimately republican aesthetic agency. Um, and I just uh, uh, have this up here, uh, a copy of the title of the front page of the book. Um, I'm not here to sell books, but they're ridiculously expensive to my academic publisher. So if anybody later in the day wants to approach me for a copy, um, I just brought along a, a couple. But uh, thank you very much. And thank you so much for all this. Mm -hmm.